Welcome, Philippe. Hello, and good evening, and welcome. Bienvenidos, friends of the Hispanic Society, and a special welcome to our Museum of Fine Arts of Houston friends who are turning in, or rather tuning in for the first time. We're pleased to host a special installment of our program, Las Tertulias de Artistano, or Hispanic Art Gatherings. And tonight I have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. James B. Anno, Associate Curator of European Art at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. We continue these conversations on Tuesday evenings each month. And if you are not yet a member of the Hispanic Society, please do consider joining by going to our website. It's hispanicsociety.org, search for membership, and just go under support. Some members of our audience tuning in tonight may be unfamiliar with the museum, the Hispanic Society, and its collections. The Hispanic Society Museum and Library, which is located in Washington Heights in Upper Manhattan, was founded in 1904 and opened to the public in 1908. And its collections reflect the vision of its founder, Arthur Milton Huntington, who lived until uh, from 1870 to 1955, and he was really one of America's greatest philanthropists. The collections are unparalleled in their scope and quality outside of the I we mean uh, that quite literally they are an equal. And uh, they focus on all facets of art, literature, culture, Spain, Portugal, in other words, the Iberian Peninsula, Latin America, and the Philippines up to the early 20th century. Now, the museum and library are currently closed for renovation. We have robust programming for adults and children, and those can be accessed on our website. Dr. will discuss the installation of the show, Glory of Spain, Treasures from the Hispanic Society Museum and Library, which is on view and has been for quite a while because of the strange year that we've had at the Fine Arts in Houston through January the 3rd of 2020. For tickets and exhibition details, uh, just click on the links in the description of this YouTube video, which are below. James Anno, whose dissertation incidentally was on no less than Michelangelo, Prior to his arrival at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston in 2019, was the first postdoctoral curatorial fellow at the Capodimonte Museum in Naples, where Italy, not Florida, uh, where he co curated the renowned Farnese collection. At Capodimonte, among many innovative programs which he spearheaded, Dr. Anno was instrumental in the creation of the Capodimonte Google arms and culture platform, which increased the museum's digital catalog by over a thousand images. It is one of the most robust digital platforms in all of Italy. Anna also initiated and led Capodimonte's creation of nearly 400 bilingual war labels and texts for the permanent collections, marking a critical step toward opening the museum to an international audience. Dr. Anno has published essays on Baroque painters, Artemisio Gentileschi, Francesco Guarino, and the Frenchman, Simon Vouet, who worked in Rome. And he co-authored with Christopher Ducker the exhibition catalog for Fish and Blood, Italian masterpieces from the Capodimonte Museum, which was seen at the Seattle Art Museum, as well as at the uh, Kimball uh, in Fort Worth. After James' presentation, we will have a brief conversation, he and I, and then we'll invite you to join afterwards by submitting your questions, and you can do it any time during the program, and submitting the questions in the comments section. You may submit a question, as I said, any time during the discussion. So thank you all for being with us. And now I turn over the, well, it isn't a podium exactly, but uh, we move and shift over from cold New York to, uh, 
tepid sister. Dan. Thank you so much, Philippe. Uh, thank you for your kind introduction and warm welcome. It's a real pleasure to join you on the Tertulia series. I'm honored to represent uh, the Museum of Fine Arts Houston this evening and to discuss a little bit our exhibition, Glory of Spain, Treasures from the Hispanic Society Museum and Library. Um, I have a nice presentation for you and all of our viewers this evening. Uh, the concept will be to step through the space of our exhibition, uh, starting uh, in antiquity in Spain and moving all the way to modern Spain. So we're talking about a span within the exhibition of more than 4,000 years uh, of Hispanic art and culture, beginning with the Bell Beaker culture, 2400 BC, all the way up into uh, modern painters like Joaquin Soroya, uh, Zuluaga, etc. The presentation is structured in six sections, uh, which parallels the, the logic of our exhibition. There are six sections in the exhibition that proceed chronologically. Uh, we'll begin at the, be uh, at the beginning of the exhibition. We'll, we'll uh, start there. And the images and video that we have for you within the uh, presentation are excerpts from a film that we produced, which is a guided tour uh, of the exhibition, one of our endeavors that we undertook uh, during the pandemic period. So we'll be very happy uh, to share that with you. And I thank, on that note, my colleague here at the museum, Evan Leslie, for putting together this beautiful deck for us this evening. Uh, a few words about the action, uh, exhibition before we launch in. The exhibition we believe has something for everyone. There's 220 artworks in this exhibition. So it's quite large, again, spanning 4,000 years of Hispanic art and culture. Uh, we feel that the very diverse object types and media types that are represented in the exhibition present something for everyone. We have marble, marble sculpture, jewelry, textiles, uh, plenty of works on paper, including etchings, maps, books. Of course, we have paintings, silver work. The list is very long. Uh, more or less every major medium that an artist has worked on in the last 4,000 years is represented in this exhibition. And most importantly, I would say, each object is a prime example of its type represented in the exhibition. And this is no doubt a great testament uh, to the very high quality of permanent collection that the Hispanic society enjoys. Every object in the exhibition is, is the best of its kind. Uh, so as we move uh, forward towards our presentation, Evan, if you would cue our title slide, please. Thank you. Uh, I would like to tell you that the exhibition opened March 1st, just a few weeks before, prior to the pandemic, and will remain open until January 3rd. So we've had an incredibly long run of this exhibition, which is uh, greatly pleases us. And if you're in the area or are you know, inclined to come visit, please come do so before January 3rd. Now, let's begin our presentation of the exhibition uh, by moving to our first section of the exhibition, Antiquity in Spain. Evan, mm -hmm. slide please. So Antiquity in Spain is our smallest section of the exhibition. Here you're getting a few panning shots of the gallery space. Uh, our most ancient works in this section are from the Bell Beaker cult culture, 2400 BC. We have pre-Roman cultures also represented with the Celtiberians and their jewelry as well as Roman works. Uh, Roman Spain, uh, Spain, the Iberian Peninsula was first uh, invaded by the Romans in 218 BC, but it's only with uh, the reign of Augustus around 19 BC that the entirety of the peninsula was subdued. Next slide, please. Our feature work of this section uh, for the presentation this evening is our Head of Medusa, uh, Roman work um, that was excavated near Seville, Spain, around 1901 by the archeologist, George Bonsoir. Here you can see this beautiful mosaic, which is comprised of many tiles or tesserae of multicolors, represents the image of Medusa, uh, one of three Gorgons from ancient Greek myth, uh, whose uh, snake-filled hair could turn men to stone simply by looking at her gaze. Here, uh, after, 
Perseus has no doubt subdued the Gorgon. We have her head floating within this beautiful uh, roundel of a mosaic. The mosaic which itself was originally uh, installed in the floor of a Roman villa just outside of Seville, Spain, and served as an apotropaic uh, function or object to both uh, protect the owner of the villa from the evil eye, the malocchio, as we call it in Italian, or any um, to, to repulse any negative wishes for the owner as uh, the visitor to the villa would enter through the doorway of the house. They would have been greeted by this Gorgon. Now what we're going to do is leap forward in time as well as within the actual space of the exhibition to medieval Spain. Slide please. Medieval Spain is a very complex period in the history of European history, but also the Iberian Peninsula where you have uh, multiple cultures and religions uh, coexisting and living by one another. Uh, the Iberian Peninsula from 711 onward with the invasion of the Umayyad dynasty uh, was predominantly ruled by Islamic forces for nearly 800 years until the culmination of the Christian Reconquista in 1492. So we have a very complex history that we're dealing with. This is also one of our most uh, uh, richest sections of the exhibition in terms of objects on view. We have liturgical objects like this uh, beautiful uh, liturgical vestment that you're looking at now on the screen, as well as metal works for liturgical objects, uh, panel paintings, myolica, uh, as well as wooden polychrome sculpture. So let's move forward to our feature object of medieval Spain. We have this resplendent chalice, possibly from Segovia, that is silver gilt cast with the repoussé technique and is also chased. It's a remarkable object. Uh, it gives us a sense that uh, the artistry that craftsmen imbued these objects with, particularly within a sacred context, uh, was of the highest order. Uh, this chalice is also of particular interest to us because it marks stylistically uh, the transition from the Renaissance period, uh, or rather from the late medieval period, the Gothic period, the high Gothic period, uh, to the uh, Renaissance period. Looking at the cup itself, around the bottom of the cup, we have this gorgeous Rinso frieze, which is a motif fundamentally taken from a pagan Roman antiquity, which therefore makes it classical and fulfilling uh, the period term that we use for the Renaissance, the rebirth, of classical antiquity. And then moving down to the stem of the chalice, we see this incredible architectural uh, structure on the stem with spires, flying butresses, as well as tracer tracery, which would have been used to hold stained glass in place on the facade of a Gothic church. And so we have this incredible transition then stylistically on this liturgical object that would have been used uh, during the Roman Catholic Rite of the Mass uh, reflecting light from it as uh, communion was served. Moving forward from medieval Spain, uh, we go to Golden Age Spain. And we'll listen to the audio. In the 1500, Spain was the most powerful country in the Western world, having been unified in the previous century by the marriage of Isabella I of Castile and Ferdinand II of Aragon. It controlled parts of Italy, the Netherlands, the Philippines, and the Americas. The 1600s were marked by political and economic crisis, but the arts continued to flourish. This was the era of the great artists Velazquez, Ribera, Murillo, and Zurbaran. Okay, and forward please uh, to the clip of our feature object. If you would pause, Evan, thank you. Uh, a few words about additional words about the golden age in Spain. Evan, if you would pause, please. Thank you. Uh, the golden age in Spain is a, is a critical passage in the history of, of course, Spain, the Iberian Pen Peninsula, as well as its global reach. This is the period, uh, the tail end of the 15th century, all the way into the 18th century, uh, where Spain is exercising incredible uh, influence and dominion across the Atlantic in the lands that were discovered by Europeans um, 
in what was once called the New World or the Americas, uh, what we've called in our exhibition, the Spanish Americas, where uh, Spain is, is sourcing incredible riches and, Philippe, please. Do you have an image on your screen? I don't have one on mine. I don't either. Evan, if you would rewind, rewind to a still shot of, of the Count Duke, please. There we are. Thank you. And so moving, we'll just move straight towards the portrait here of Count Duke Olivares, one of the great painters of Golden Age Spain uh, the, during the Baroque period, the 17th century is Diego Velazquez. Um, considered by most to be the greatest Spanish painter in the history of art, perhaps the greatest painter in the Western tradition writ large. Here we have a very penetrating portrait. Evan, go ahead and, and play this, if you will, please. A penetrating portrait of the Count Duke Olivares, who was the valido or favorite of King Philip IV of Spain. Uh, Count Duke Olivares was uh, highly placed within the aristocratic apparatus around the throne of King Philip V exercised immense uh, influence for a good deal of his career and also is responsible for bringing Velazquez to Madrid uh, finally, permanently in 1623 to become uh, the, the head painter at the court of King Philip IV. We can see the Count Duke uh, Olivares here sporting his very stylish, uh, dark black Spanish garb and on his person, there are many attributes or objects that distinguish his standing within the Spanish kingdom, including for instance, uh, this long tall riding crop that he's holding in uh, his right hand, which indicates that he is master of the king's horse. So we have here an example of a portrait of a very important personage in Golden Age Spain, painted by one of the great painters of the period, uh, Diego Velazquez and it's an incredible jewel that we have in the exhibition. Now we're going to proceed to the Spanish America section, hopping across uh, the Atlantic Ocean uh, and take a look at Mexico, Central and South America. Evan, slide please. Agriculture and mining in the Americas enriched 16th and 17th century Spain. In the Americas, the evangelism of the Catholic preaching orders also drove expansion of the colonies and devotional artwork was created to fill new churches and monasteries. The artworks in this section trace the cultural exchange between Spanish artists and patrons and those of modern day Mexico, Ecuador, and Peru. The variety and superior quality of these works are a poignant counterpoint to the violence and societal disruption of colonialism in Latin America. So one slide, please, Evan. Our feature object of this section attributed to Manuel Chile, uh, indigenous Ecuadorian artist uh, working primarily out of Quito, are these four incredible wooden uh, polychromed statuettes which express the Roman Catholic dogma of, of the fate of the soul at death, eschatology as we would say it. Uh, on the left here, we have the soul at death uh, represented by a skeleton uh, no doubt in the process of decay. And as we move to our right, we see this individual with hair flying back, uh, mouth wide open, screaming with chains around his neck and his arms representing uh, the soul in hell. And then to our right again, we have a figure whose hands are clasped in prayer, looking up to the heavens with only the slightest flames flickering uh, at his torso which is an indication that this soul is in the state of purgatory, uh, transitional uh, state, if you will, where the soul is purged or cleansed uh, on its way to heaven. And then finally, to our far right, we have the soul in beatitude or heaven. Again, gently clasping hands, praying, looking up towards the heavens, which now the, the soul has the pleasure of being in with gently rolling clouds around the base of the work. We can see here this incredible work is 
no doubt uh, springing from the European figurative style, uh, yet the incredible expression and whole conceit of such a suite of statuettes is quite novel and incredible. It makes us wonder how would they have been used? Uh, we think probably within a private devotional context, whether at the home altar of a wealthy patron or perhaps uh, a small chapel within a church. Moving to our fifth of six sections of the exhibition, uh, we'll go back to Spain, to Enlightenment Spain. Evan, slide please. In the late 18th century, as Europe embraced the Enlightenment principles of reason and refined international styles in the arts, Francisco de Goya became the most important artist in Spain. The self-conscious, often dark and ironic themes of his artwork speak to an era of great change. Revolutionary sentiments and war spread throughout the European continent. The Peninsular War saw the arrival of Napoleon's French troops in Portugal and Spain, challenging the Bourbon kings who had ruled Spain for several generations. Goya and his contemporaries thus worked in an age enlightened by reason, yet overshadowed by war. Slide please, Evan. So we've come to our star object of the exhibition, Francisco de Goya's the Duchess of Alba portrait executed in 1797. Uh, this work is uh, enwrapped in both uh, acclaim and mystery, particularly for speculation, no doubt fanciful, but fun uh, to, to speculate regarding the relationship between the artist and patron. The Duchess of Alba here is at the age of 35, perhaps the height of her beauty. She was known to be a great beauty during her day. Uh, this is 1797, just when her husband had died. So her black dress, the Maha dress, an urban bourgeois outfit that she's wearing also doubles perhaps as a, a morning outfit. But we nonetheless get the sense that there's a there's an element of play here between the Duchess and the viewer or the artist. Her gaze is absolutely direct, confident, perhaps even a little sassy. Uh, her hand, uh, right hand points down to the ground where inscribed in the dirt reads solo Goya, only Goya. And on her two fingers on her right hand that's pointing to the ground, she also has two rings. Inscribed on those rings is Alba and Goya. So it makes one wonder just uh, how either fanciful Goya's imagination or desire it was for the Duchess to add these elements or the complexity and nuance of their relationship. We know that five years later from when this portrait was executed, uh, coming to 1803, 1802, excuse me, the Duchess dies at the age of 40. Uh, Goya perishes in 1828. So that's over 20 years later. Nonetheless, uh, this great work uh, still remained in his studio upon his death, which gives us the sense that he just couldn't let the portrait go. Now, moving forward in time and in the exhibition again, we'll, we'll move to our last section in the final section of my presentation before we open this up to conversation uh, with Philippe and any questions that have come in, uh, arriving now at our section, Modern Spain. In modern Spain, this is the final passage of our exhibition, uh, predominated by paintings, but we also have an album of photographs, as you're seeing here, a photograph of the Alhambra in Granada, Spain, as well as many excellent uh, late 19th, but predominantly early 20th century paintings by Soroya, which you see here, uh, as well as two great works by his counterpart and rival to some degree, Ignacio Zuluaga, which uh, brings us to our uh, feature image object of this section of the exhibition. Uh, Evan, slide please. Here we have Zuluaga's uh, Family of the Gypsy Bullfighter executed in 1903. Uh, Zuluaga is an interesting figure. He, of course, is Spanish, uh, but was born into a, a family of artists and moved to Paris in 1888 for his training, where he met the likes of very famous uh, French artists, including Rodin, uh, Toulouse-Lautrec, as well as Dugas. Uh, but he never forgot his Spanish roots, of course, and 
this painting is somewhat emblematic of the the soul if you will of spain in terms of in regards of dealing with the bull which has a very resonant place in the myth history and psyche of spain here we have uh, ostensibly a family gathered together in a, in a plainer manner with the mater familia setting at the middle uh, commanding the composition if you will as well as our viewers gaze and her hand is a uh, fan which uh, might indicate that it's a little stuffy in the room as she looks to her right, our left, at the matador sitting down with a little boy on his knee. Perhaps the boy is a bit mischievous. Uh, we would think that this is indeed a family according to the title, but we know that in fact, uh, all of the figures in the painting uh, were models, uh, artist models from Madrid, with the exception of this younger, beautiful woman in the green dress to our far right, who was Zuluaga's niece. Nonetheless, this, this painting is a real world-class expert treatment in the psychology of figures interacting with one another, primarily through the power of glance. Here, as we look at each figure, we can see one figure glancing in a direction and calling the attention of the other figures around them by various movements and glances, crisscrossing across the panel, leading our eye from one figure to the other, creating a sense of narrative and cohesion, if you will, uh, within the canvas itself, a very ingenious uh, composition, no doubt, that Zuluaga has offered us. So this concludes my brief presentation for this portion uh, of our program this evening. Uh, Reminding you that the exhibition closes January 3, I will turn it over uh, to Philippe or the Hispanic Society, and we can go from here. Thank you so much, James, for this uh, presentation. Uh, it's very exciting for us uh, in New York to sort of see um, in microcosm, a kind of a transversal collections, beautifully told as they are in Houston. Uh, we've had a number of questions from uh, composed of both our members and yours. And um, I have one uh, question that I want to, uh, one point I want to pick up on, which is in your uh, section on medieval Spain, um, we saw quite a bit of Christian art, uh, but uh, it would be interesting uh, to remind that uh, both in Spain and certainly in this exhibition, uh, there's an indication of the interrelationship and actually the rather cordial relationship that existed before Isabella the Catholic in 1492 in Granada and in southern Spain among Jews and uh, Muslims, and there are some objects that are testament to that, no, in the exhibition. There are. Uh, excellent point. This is one of the fascinating aspects of the history of medieval Spain. I believe in our slide deck, uh, we have an ivory uh, Evan, if you would start with the pixies. Thank you. Uh, you're, you're exactly right. Uh, you know, the, the history of the Iberian Peninsula is complex. Uh, for much of its history from, let's say, the 8th century forward, uh, the Islamic forces were ascendant, eventually being rolled back again to 1492 at the culmination of the Reconquista. But we have a situation uh, where Christian kingdoms, Islamic kingdoms, as well as Jewish peoples all existed together on the peninsula. This pixies here is a, is a prime example of how objects travel and transform their function uh, depending on who possesses them. This gorgeous pixis uh, by Khalaf, the Islamic uh, craftsman dating to the 10th century uh, at the royal court of Cordoba uh, carved this piece of ivory, which has a, a clasp that we're seeing here as well as uh, two um, silver gilt uh, hinges on the other side of the pixis. Uh, would have contained uh, perfumes for one of the princesses at the court of Cordoba. And if you look at the rim of the lid here, you have Cufic script, which is actually erotic uh, love poetry. 
Now, what happens often, we know this has happened in the history of art, is that when one predominant culture or kingdom surpasses or surmounts the other, the objects don't necessarily just all disappear or are destroyed. Rather, an object like this uh, Pixies, which would have held uh, sweet perfumes, could, for instance, be transformed into a Christian reliquary where, uh, you know, holy objects, whether it be the bones of saints or other material objects that, uh, according to, of course, Christian theology and practice would have been uh, transmitters of grace, could have been placed within this Pixis on the altar in a Roman Catholic church, uh, which demonstrates that the, the beauty of these objects was admired and recognized to the degree where various cultures might pass them on one to the next and therefore transforming their meaning and their function. Uh, we also have uh, a, one of our wonderful manuscripts in the exhibition from the Hispanic Society, uh, our Hebrew Bible here. We see the binding to our left and then one of the illuminated, um, an illuminated folio from inside the book. Here, uh, again, incredible illumination. Uh, that shares in a very close verisimilitude, we might say, to illuminated tick text within the Christian tradition. So we see uh, that Jewish craftsmen, Islamic craftsmen, Christian craftsmen are all looking at the objects that exist on the peninsula. Uh, motifs travel and techniques, materials travel and, and traverse these, these cultures. This page here that we're looking at uh, is comprised of uh, gold inlaid Sephardic block text that is surrounded by incredible uh, illuminations of animals, other natural cre creatures, as well as floral patterns. So this book itself, uh, if we see here the dating from 1450 to 1497, also reflects the complex uh, political religious realities that unfold on the Iberian Peninsula during this period, particularly with the culmination of the Reconquista in 1492, where Christian forces under Ferdinand and Isabella consolidate their grip on the peninsula and expelling the Jews in 1492 at its culmination, whereby many uh, Jews uh, fled to Portugal. And unfortunately in 1497, uh, the Jews were also expelled from Portugal. So this object traveled from Spain to Portugal and then further abroad, again, mapping the entire movement of a, of a people group in Spain. So you're absolutely right. It's an incredibly complex and, and rich and at times violent and troubling uh, history that we can find on the uh, Iberian Peninsula between all of these cultures. Uh, thank, you. thank you, James. I think that was... Uh... I'm so glad that you had on these uh, uh, these slides. These are major objects. And one of the viewers, and I must take that one question now, asks, well, um, you boasted that you are um, uh, unrivaled in the sense that there is no other institution in the world where under one roof you can see all of the, the arts that are presented, uh, or the choice that presented in Morgan Houston. It is true. And then the question was, well, where is it it was really very simple. Uh, the interest of Huntington was Spain, the Iberian Peninsula, and its legacy uh, in the Americas. Pre-Columbian art is pre-Columbus, pre-Conquista. So it's very simple. We don't collect it because it's Hispanic. Um, at this point, um, uh, Christina Aldrich from uh, the Hispanic Society is usually a porte-parole for uh, conveying questions from the audience. Why should we have them all? Yes, thank you both so much. Uh, we have a member who has emailed in a few questions and they are wondering, uh, especially for James, if you have seen any special connections uh, between the works from the Hispanic Society in, in the exhibition and any works from your permanent collection. Mm. Well, there's, there's many, uh, there's many, and this is a testament to both of our institutions, uh, both the Hispanic Society Museum and Library, as well as the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. Uh, both are encyclopedic in their own defined way, 
encyclopedic for the Hispanic Society regarding kind of the, the comprehensive cross section uh, that the Hispanic Society can pr present in terms of Hispanic art and culture, uh, particularly from antiquity into the 20th century. And then the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, where we are now, of course, and host the exhibition uh, where we have an encyclopedic offering of artworks from cultures all around the world from antiquity to the present. So there's bound to be some connections, uh, some overlap there. Uh, out of the many areas that we could touch upon, and particularly drawing on my own, uh, the area that I work in professionally, which would be the early modern period Renaissance, Baroque, um, we have uh, a not so long ago recently attributed work uh, by Diego Velasquez of The Kitchen Maid, which of course in the Hispanic Society show or Glory of Spain, we have three incredible portraits by Velasquez. Uh, the portrait that we saw in the presentation of Count Ducal overlap there in paintings. Uh, we also have a wonderful still life by Francisco de Goya. Uh, when we have many works by Goya in the Glory of Spain exhibition, uh, two portraits as well as more than around 20 works on paper by Goya. And the Museum of Fine Arts Houston also possesses a good number of works on paper by Goya as well, over 100, which are in the, the Blaffer collection. So those are just a few examples. But yes, I mean, there's an incredibly rich overlap uh, between both the exhibition and our institution in that regard. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. And this is a question coming through the chat. Uh, does the Hispanic Society have more than one traveling exhibition or does the museum select from the larger Hispanic Society collection? Well, uh, that's a good question. The exhibition this is currently in Houston is an exhibition that was mounted as a result of our having to close the main building in Upper Manhattan uh, for urgent repairs. Uh, when uh, the news uh, traveled that the museum was going to be closed, the Prado Museum in Madrid said, oh, uh, do you think that you could, we could mount an exhibition of uh, visions of Spain? Uh, we were only too pleased. And so the exhibition actually opened at the Prado Museum uh, in Madrid, and it was curated by the director of the Prado and the senior curator, Gabriele Finaldi, who is now director of the National Gallery in London. The exhibition then traveled to one or two other places, including Mexico City, and we're delighted that it is now uh, in uh, Houston. But uh, we have a library uh, that contains manuscripts and uh, uh, of over 600,000 items. Uh, there are still a great many paintings and uh, works by Soroya, for example. A number of museums have been uh, eager to show some of the uh, 200 watercolors and gouaches by Soroya that we still have. And uh, we are lending a number of works to Auckland Castle, which is a very interesting museum in. Uh, Northern uh, England that is about to open, um, uh, I guess in June, I think of uh, 2021, where we will be lending a number of pictures without uh, taking any from this one exhibition. So uh, the, the, the riches of the Hispanic society never cease to amaze me, frankly. Thank you. Uh, we have another question. Um, for, it could be for both of you, and that is, has seen these works in Houston in a different setting? Uh, have they changed at all for you in meaning or have you seen them in a new light? Do you think it enhances the works to see them in various settings? For example, in uh, the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston or in the Prado, or do you think that you, you enjoy seeing them in in the Hispanic society where they usually are? Well, let, let me start because I think it's more logical uh, that I answer that one. Um, I have seen all of the venues of the exhibition in uh, the Prado, Mexico City, in Albuquerque, uh, in, in, in Cincinnati, 
And it was a, a different exhibition each time. The spaces were different. The curatorial eye was different. The conjunction of works was different. And there's no question that the context was different. In some museum, the emphasis was a little more maybe on the object individually and others in the story. Um, and uh, I found it absolutely fascinating. There's no question that uh, the transfer from one place to another uh, made an enormous difference. What did you think, James? Uh, very well said. Uh, I think that's absolutely the right place to start. Any, by matter of fact, anytime you move these objects from one space to another, you're going to have a different exhibition, even, even when the uh, objects are the same. I will add on that point that we requested, and of course we're happy to have learned that you've accepted our request for 10 more works on paper by Goya, as well as the great uh, Velasquez portrait of Camilo Astoli, which I believe may have traveled to uh, Madrid for the Prado exhibition, but hadn't been in any of the intermittent exhibitions. You're the only one who has all three paintings by Velasquez. So, of course, you know, that means that ours is the most intriguing. Uh, I have to say that coming from Houston. No, but in a serious manner and from a curatorial perspective, um, this is such a, this is such a multi-layered question. For the most part, as a curator, you know, in, in mounting an exhibition like this, we receive a, a, a checklist of objects that are going to come to us and that's, that's it. That's where the show starts. Everything else, uh, is a dis everything that you see in the exhibition represents a decision made. Uh, you know, the process of, of conceptualizing how, how to organize this material is both exhilarating and at times frustrating and challenging, especially with this many objects and the diverse range of media that, that they represent. Uh, because just the technical, uh, practical aspects of presenting these objects, whether they be in a vitrine or on the wall, et cetera, uh, imposes real possibilities and delimitations in terms of what can be done. And this is important, I think, uh, for our public, our, our mutual publics to understand about museum work is that we're constrained by space, we're constrained by the, the capacities of our staff, of the layout of our exhibition galleries. And this has a, this has a very direct hand in shaping how to proceed. And so my approach to this exhibition was to embrace those realities, particularly the floor plan of where the exhibition is displayed at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, and to use uh, the shape, the nature of our space, which is quite open, a quite large 14,000 square feet, high ceilings, high walls, uh, to use these aspects uh, to my advantage and how I you know, made decisions in terms of where to display objects in pr proximity to what other objects. And so my, my final point on this, which I, could, I can continue, I could continue you know, ad nauseum on this point, is that it, a few things occurred to me while curating the exhibition. We, the proportionality between three-dimensional objects and two-dimensional objects is not 50-50. In fact, there's more three-dimensional objects, which means that for a large exhibition space with a lot of wall, it creates an issue of how to fill the walls, essentially. So one of the innovations that we have for our venue in Houston uh, is that I opted for uh, creating, with, of course, with my team, large photo murals of key architectural monuments for each period of the exhibition, and this adds its own context and flavor. Other, uh, other guiding axioms that I kept in mind were notions, of course, of balance, harm uh, harmony, creating viewing axes and, and viewing lanes to where I could organize objects in terms of what I would want to be seen, uh, one object in relation to another. Uh, and I hope that the sensation, one of the sensations that our viewers have when they come to the Museum of Fine Arts Houston to see the exhibition, is that this, this, this exhibition demands to be explored. It demands your active participation to ambulate through the space and to discover the, the incredible artworks that lay around the corner or just outside of your peripheral view. 
And so I hope that the experience is, is one that's very engaging uh, in that sense. Thank you for that question. Wonderful. Thank you both again. That was actually the last question. Um, the rest coming through the comments are just giving you thanks um, for such a wonderful talk. So if Philippe would like to ask any final question, I will let him go ahead. And Philippe, you are muted. I think that I will not ask a further question simply because I think this was a uh, uh, a wonderful answer and uh, a, a, a perfect summation in a sense of what is the job of a curator, which is a very creative, recreative one uh, dealing with works of art. So James, thank you very much for your insights, for the one, wonderful presentation. I would have thanked all of you, members in Houston as well, uh, our community, the Friends of the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, for this tertulia. Uh, we're very thrilled that our own supporters continue to be with us, notwithstanding the fact that we cannot be in person. Uh, and I want to end by reminding you that our next tertulia will take place uh, on Tuesday, uh, January the 12th, in other words, already in 2021, at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we will explore that an extraordinary collection at the Hispanic Society of early uh, musical manuscripts uh, with Sebastian uh, Ogilvy. So on that note, I wish you all very happy holidays uh, and a, a safe at the end of the year. Thank you all very much. Thank you, James.